Hello, hello. This is Alex Burkett, and you're listening to the Long Game Podcast. In this episode, I'm talking to Ilona Abramova. Ilona is the VP of Operations at AppSumo and is an absolute genius at email marketing and copywriting. For me, this was an interesting conversation because it was far different from our other Long Game episodes. First, Ilona and AppSumo are a client of Omniscience and uh, one of my favorite clients to work with. Second, Ilona is a friend and someone who shares my divergent and semi-ADD tendencies in conversation. Finally, instead of talking about content marketing or SEO or diving into Ilona's background, which we tend to do on other long game episodes, I thought it'd be interesting to do a live consultation. So in this episode, Ilona is going to teach me how we should be doing email marketing at Omniscient. So one note on the recording of this, there was actually so much to discuss that we split this into two separate uh, recordings. So we actually rescheduled a second session for later the next week, um, but it's spliced together in a way that feels totally continuous. So if you're listening through, it's it's sort of barely noticeable, but we catch up in two parts. So it's a, it's a beefy one. It's There's a lot of material here, um, but just note that. So if you're building an email marketing program from scratch, or if you're revamping it for more ROI, you'll find this episode useful. But I also think it's just a fun exploration of ideas and sort of a brainstorm that touches upon email marketing best practices and general marketing best practices, honestly, and some rants as well, that anybody can use to increase the effectiveness of the program and honestly, just how you think about content, email, and kind of the synergy between those. So I would look at this as a masterclass on email, but also as a pretty neat look behind the curtains at what it's like getting consulted from an email marketing master. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Ilona. never really thought about it like I never it never occurred to me that like I was potentially seeking approval from somebody or like you know what I mean like mm. all those things there's so much of that um so it's, it's funny cool I just I, I just came to a similar insight with with how I have set myself up in roles at companies but then also through the agency it's like through whatever like uh relationship with my parents I found myself always seeking somebody who is hard to impress <laughs> and slightly distant and wanting to impress them mm-hmm. essentially like putting myself in those positions where I always have to like ratchet it up and like kind of stretch myself in order to like get that validation and yeah. I'm like all right I don't know I mean as soon as you're aware of it you can kind of choose like do I like this or do I not like this yeah. and it's one of those things where I'm kind of thinking through that now because I'm like it, it probably has produced a lot of really good work but yeah. at what cost in terms of like you know bleeding myself dry and like stretching myself thin well, it's also just like, I think that there's this, like, yes, there's obviously the negative ramifications of like, are you doing too much? And then, you know, at what point is it no longer serving you? But it's like people constantly are pathologizing themselves and trying to mm-hmm. fix themselves. And it's like, but if you're doing well, like it's gotten you this far. So it, it's not all bad. It's not all bad that you're seeking, you know, someone whose approval is hard to get because it pushes you to be better. It's like, similarly with, I've heard this with people who have ADHD. It's like, a lot of people are not on medication because it's like, this is a superpower for me. I have, my brain is thinking about a billion different things at the same time. And like, that is, that, that got me to where I am. And I think that we have this culture where we're trying to fix ourselves constantly. And like some things it's like, they don't necessarily need to be fixed. They just need to be addressed. Like you can like be aware of it and try to tamper it where it doesn't serve you, but it doesn't mean that it's like all bad. I don't know. No, I think it's all, it's like 90% awareness. Like, cause as soon as you're aware of it, you can choose what to do with it. And if it's still helping you, like, why would you change it? It's like, all right, this is still a tool. Like I'm, I'm, grateful it's here but if it's not a tool then you can choose to basically alter it delete it you know do whatever you want with that behavior but it's like as soon as it raises to that issue of like being aware being salient um then i think that's everything it's like that quote it's like a carl jung quote i'll probably fuck it up but uh until you make the unconscious conscious it will rule Mm -hmm. your life and you will call it destiny i Mm -hmm. love that one because like until you know those things it's like you just think oh this is the way this is the way things are like this is the way it has to be you know but it's also, I think, you know what I find really fascinating is that I I find that when you're, you know, when you're a child and you think whatever you have in your, like in your house is just normal. Like it's like up until a certain age, until you start seeing other people's families and stuff. And then mm-hmm. you're like, oh, okay, no, 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 maybe this isn't normal. But like you take everything as like, 
this is what life is like for people, you know? And it's, it's, it's those things where it's like, how much of that are you kind of just like subconsciously doing where you're like, yeah, everyone does this way or everyone. It's like, that's just normal. And then it's only when you start realizing it's like, oh, actually this may be divergent. Like this is maybe not the norm and it's not, um, it's, it's not healthy what I'm doing. It's, I think that that, that stuff is so interesting because you as a kid inherently can't understand those things. And so you're kind of a kid for a long time as you're trying to piece together, like what is normal and what isn't. Yeah. It's like seeing things done in a different way proves to you that it can be done in a different way. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, um, should we talk about, talk email? about email marketing? <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay. Oh, we, should we should talk- just do a psychology podcast because that would be way more fun. <laughs> um, I think no matter what kind of podcast we do, it's going to turn into that. So it's, you know, let's just roll with it. And we're obviously going to be divergent as, as is the norm. So, yeah. um, let's talk about Costa Rica later too. Okay. I want to get some like more details on that, but all right. Uh, yeah. So let's go with the email stuff. So basically the context of this conversation, you're an email marketing expert. I'm an email marketing noob. <laughs> We're doing email marketing at Omniscient, uh, even though we wouldn't consider it email marketing. In fact, I was talking to David about like doing this podcast and I'm like, hey, what if instead of the normal long game thing uh, where we do like a long form interview and it's divergent and we talk about all kinds of issues, what if I ask Ilona kind of like to, to consult us and our, our own practices in how we're doing email? And David's like, I don't know, should we invest in email marketing? <laughs> like I, th- I think we already are. So one question to start is how you define email marketing, because it seems like everybody's doing it, but they wouldn't say they're doing email marketing. Like what yeah. falls under the email marketing umbrella? There's like SDR type stuff. There's lead yeah. nurturing. Like there's so many things that could be construed as email. Yeah. I would say that if you're sending an email with the goal of making a sale or telling a potential customer or client about something, you're engaging in email marketing. So it's like, it's email and it's marketing. <laughs> so it's email marketing, but there are definitely different types, right? Depending on the sector you're in. Um, the most, I think most people when they're thinking about email marketing are thinking about e-commerce, but there's, that's definitely just a, a, a niche of the entire funnel. But a lot of the principles are going to be the same regardless of what you're selling. So if you learn kind of like the basics of how to talk to people and how to convey your messaging and when to talk to them, you can improve your conversions from email, regardless of what it is that you're selling. Okay. So I, I don't think of it, I, I guess I do a little bit with e- e-commerce because you get like cart abandonment emails and kind of automated triggered emails. I think of it with, uh, with B2B in terms of like at CXL, we ran like a newsletter. We would send like, mm-hmm. I think one or two emails per week. And I consider that like our email marketing we would do tons of stuff with like lead capture and like, basically it was the old saying that like the money's in the list. So like everything Mm -hmm. we did on the marketing side was like to capture emails. Then we would like do those newsletters to engage them. And we did a little bit of nurturing to kind of like convert and like it was more structured automated way. Um, But it it was all kind of, yeah, sorry. No, go ahead. That's the hard part about Zoom. It's like we normally would interrupt each other, but on Zoom, it feels weirder. So yeah. feel feel free to you know interject at any time. <laughs> I was gonna say that even if you're sending even if you're sending a newsletter, even if like um, the Morning Brew, right, which is not they're not directly selling you anything in the newsletter, but they're they still are right. They're send, they're selling you their brand. They're selling ad space. They're they're selling engagement and like awareness of other products. So. Um, yes, the definition of what, like, there's obviously like the click to buy, which is a lot more direct, but it's really more about like, how are you getting into the mind of the people on your list and providing them value and kind of selling yourself and your offer and brand to those people? Yeah. Does, does email marketing include outbound? Like if somebody's like, is it a criteria, like you have to opt into an email list or like, I don't know, like, cause you do sales emails and that that's kind of scaled too. And you're still trying to sell something. Um, you could also buy email lists. I suppose that's, that's also email marketing. Like, do you yeah, distinguish between but, those things? Yeah. I, I think for, for me, this is just a personal definition. I think that you need opt-in. So an email mark, like I think email marketing is performed when you have an email list that's consented to receive something from you. They basically tell you, Hey, I want to hear from you. And then you leverage that platform. To communicate with them. I think with, I've, I have experienced in the, the B2B outreach side of things. 
I don't consider that to be email marketing. I think that's a lot more, that's a lot closer to, to sales to me. Okay. So they both use email as kind of the medium of uh, communication transfer, but one is for sales, one is for marketing and like the kind of delineators that one is opt-in and one is typically not. One of, yeah, the other was cold for sure. Okay. So we want to do both of those things at Omniscient. We've done, okay. I'll let you know like what we kind of have done already and then how actually like just how you would open up kind of the discussion if you were working with us as a consultant. Um, so ask whatever questions you would need, whatever information you would need to know. But we, we've done essentially nothing automated so far. So what we've done is uh, some manual outbound sales. So in that regard, we we could probably disregard most of that for this chat, but I'll just tell you, we've done some sales. Um, Typically, if I see a company I like or or like a product I use, like if it's some, I don't know, like native deodorant, I'll just email Mm -hmm. them and be like, hey, I noticed your blog traffic, you know, is blah, blah, blah. And like, you could be ranking for these keywords that your competitors are. And just see what happens. I don't think we've actually gotten any clients from that. <laughs> we've gotten to the yeah. point where we're, we're sending over a contract. We're, we're like almost cracking that kind of code. I think that's probably unrelated. And then the other thing that we're just starting to do is collect emails and start blogging ourselves. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like the cobbler's kids have new shoes kind of thing uh, where we're constantly doing this for clients. But we, until the last couple of months, haven't invested in it. But 100%. the goal is basically write a blog post, something like, you know, how to do keyword research, sign them up for a lead magnet, like a keyword research checklist. And then we haven't done much in terms of like the, the, you know, nurturing or automation, but we send one monthly email at the end of the month. It's just kind of like five items or something like that. So that's basically all we're doing for email marketing. How would you approach this conversation to make sure we're doing things better? Yes. So the first thing I'm going to ask you is what do you want? Like, what's the goal? What's your email list? So you have uh, people on your email list. What is the, what's the target experience that you want to craft for somebody? We want to make more money. Okay. And so do you, do you have bandwidth to take on like, how many more clients do you want? Right. Like, cause I think there's also with an agency, there's also that the function of scaling means you also have to do more work. So how many like slots do you guys want to fill? I think it would be unlikely that we invest in email to the point that we're like overbooked, but because <laughs> it's it, we can we can hire pretty quickly. I think um, we could probably take on at this moment three or four clients without uh, without going completely insane, and then we would have to hire somebody else internally to basically scale up, and that would probably include another four to five. So let's say like four right now. Um, and those are like high ticket retainers. So it's not right. like a one-off kind of project. We could do tons of those. Like the, uh, we do a content strategy. I mean, I'm saying this for the, you know, anybody listening to this, you know, but we do a content strategy audit. That's like kind of a one month thing that you end up with a content roadmap report. Um, and then we do ongoing services like link building, content promotion and content production. So we could do like probably fucking 20 or 30 of those content strategy audits um, but the, the production requires obviously writers and coordination and account management and all that stuff. So, right. Yeah. Four yes, to five say, handful, handful of clients, basically. I would say since you're saying, Hey, this is going to be a high, high ticket item. You have to think about where these leads are coming from, right? So if they're coming off of a lead magnet where they want to learn, they just want a list of keywords that is going to be a much more extensive nurture, like you should then offer them a lower cost introductory package, right? This is why you'll see a lot of companies having like, um, they'll, they'll do bundles or something like smaller kind of intro packages. And so I think if you, if, that, if that's how you collected the email, then you would essentially create a tree from the way, like from the source, the lead source. And you would say like, okay, hey, they... Uh, converted off this lead magnet, we got their email because they want the list of keywords. What's a relevant piece of content that is paid, but low cost enough that you're kind of getting a foot in the door of being like, this will give you a taste of what it's like to work with us. And I know that you're interested in keyword research. So here's kind of like a module of a course for let's say $29. If you're seeing that they're a those people are going to have engagement and you have, let's say now you can see completion data, right? You can say, Hey, I'm doing this teachable. I can see that this person finished my course. Once they finish your course, you can send them another email. that was like, that could be a lot more personal. It's like, Hey, this is Alex. Like, I'd love to know uh, like what you thought about the course, anything that we can improve. And now you're kind of creating 
an opportunity to have a conversation with somebody and potentially give them, you know, a secondary upsell of, hey, like I now know that you are, you have enough intent in this process. You clearly want to learn more about SEO and content marketing. The best thing I can offer for you now, knowing who you are, is, you know, this one-off audit. Mm. And once you have a personal relationship, the it stops really being about email marketing. And now it's more like, how do you nurture interpersonally, right? What are your goals? What do you want to do? I think like, it's really, it's, it's getting the, the very first hurdle jumped over when someone has already kind of opted in and they're, you know, a subscriber or a client of yours that is now kind of within your control because you're, you're confident with the product that you're providing them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I get, I get the concept of like, an escalating scale of sort of opt-in where like somebody starts with a very low commitment thing. Like they're reading a blog post. That's like one sign of interest. And then like all the way up to the point where they're like completing courses and like interested in audits. I I understand like kind of going through that escalating chain before trying to ask for, it's like going on a first date before you ask for marriage. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, But like, so in that sense, do you think it's probably just like, we can just say we, we should avoid pitching any agency stuff from the email list or like, could we create a blanket heuristic like that for, for kind of how we're operating or like, I don't know, do you think it's even possible to, to bring somebody in via like the email list to like a direct agency sale? I think when you have that um, introductory demo call, right? Like you have your, mm-hmm. your 15 minute free call, like that is essentially a similar concept, right? You're asking somebody like, like a mini hey, consult kind of exactly like this is you'll, un, you'll get a, an idea of who we are by, by speaking with us directly. But I think even to get there, you know, it's like, it depends on how they found you. If, if they found you um, through a referral, right. Then that call is going to be a lot easier to introduce earlier on. Yeah, well, let's, um, but- let's assume that people who come in via like referrals or via like, like they're already interested in the agency. We actually have a separate right. lead form for that. That's like a consultation cool. form and we pre-qualify. So we ask like what their revenue and budget and all that stuff is. Perfect. So like we just funnel those into sales. We don't, we don't even put them on our email list, although we probably should, I guess, like, <laughs> you know, cycle them back in. So they're kind of in the, in the group or whatever. Um, but yeah, so that's separate. Let's assume for this email list stuff that everything is coming in via like a blog post, organic. Got Maybe it. they see us on social. Um, I don't know. Like it, essentially it's a little colder. It's not quite somebody coming in and being like, hey, my company wants services. Um, Cause that, that they're, they're just going to get like the free intro kind of consultative call. Um, and then the other stuff, they, they, they probably know we have an agency because it says it on the website, but they might not, <laughs> you know? Yeah. When I was at CXL, like tons of people thought we were just a blog, like nobody knew the agency existed. So that was actually a big problem is like trying to actually like create some saliency for that. But now I'm kind of thinking out loud. I'm like, maybe we can't sell somebody natural. We can't sell everybody off of the email list, like on our newsletter. Maybe we shouldn't just have like a direct pitch every time. But like if if we had like a little like tiny CTA or like a... Yeah, at the bottom, you could have like a footer that says like book a free 15 minute consulting call. I still, I mean, thinking about preserving your own time though, right? It's like, is the the first thing that I would want someone to do is be like, hey, show me that you are interested in in actually doing this, right? If the goal Mm -hmm. is sales, then a 15 minute consulting call doesn't get you sales, it's free. And then on top of that, it's time exhaustive for you guys. So like, I would say, what's something that you can do that's one and done that has instant value and that gets you revenue generating? That to me sounds more like a course or an ebook or something that you you can create one time and then be able to essentially funnel people in and give them value. Obviously, the most important thing is providing value. Um, it's not just a gotcha to get thirty bucks or whatever. It's 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 a lot more about like how do you establish these relationships? And your emails are really just a conduit for for getting you to the page, right? The goal of the email, like <laughs> I say this all the time, but it's like the goal of the email is not to sell you anything. The goal of the email is to get you to the next stage. Like you, it's it's to get you interested in the, in the product. And then it's the goal of the website and the offer itself to sell you. Mm-hmm. So if you understand that's where someone came from, if you speak to their pain points directly, if you're like, hey, like I know that you're interested in keywords, we have a lot of success with this course helping people identify their keywords by themselves. And then it's like, and then if you want extra help, 
we're also here for you for that, right? But you're kind of identifying that people have different journeys and maybe they're not ready to commit to a large ticket item without first knowing you. And this allows them to build rapport with you and 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 then kind of as in, like I said, it's in your hands to then continue the sale. Okay. Yeah. So I, this part really seems to be covering just like what, what we're offering in the first place. And like, there's a yeah. huge gap, a huge gulf between somebody who signs up for like whatever, an email list or a lead magnet, like a checklist and somebody who wants to pay $10,000 a month for content marketing. Right. So yeah, something in between. The, the goal and yeah, something in between for sure. And then the other thing that you can do more regularly with your emails, because you're not going to be just selling them a course every single week, but it's like, I think people stay on email lists when they get value. So it's like, if you guys had, you know, you're writing blog content, how do you kind of summarize that, put a snippet of that into your emails so that if I read your emails, I, I get a learning, right? Mm -hmm. Like I, I learn something every time I open an email and if I'm actually interested in SEO and improving my own content marketing, you can see that at your own engagement. And then what you could do is segment further based on engagement. So if somebody has, you can create a segment, for example, and say, Hey, if someone's opened my email three times in the last month, that probably indicates to you that they are at the very least interested in SEO, but they, they have a vested interest in what you're talking about. And then those people can then be the people that you sell something to, right? So you're not just kind of mass blasting everyone because you can clearly see some people are just not that, they're not really engaging with what you're saying. And the best way to, to, to make sales is by targeting the people that are most primed to make those sales. Okay. That makes sense. Um, I think you're going a little over my head with regards to like the, the quality of the emails and the segmentation. I'm sorry. So let's, let's plant a flag and return to that. Okay. Um, in terms of like what the goal of our content program should be, sh- should that, I mean, we have a course, the course costs, uh, like a thousand dollars in that range. Okay. I, I don't know what it is anymore. Um, it's on AppSumo. So it's, you know, cheaper on AppSumo. Nice. Um, but should that be the goal? Like, is that like a feasible, like how many courses we sell or should we even come up with like a lower kind of like, you know, a $10 ebook or something like that? Like, cause I, I think like it would be hard to goal ourselves, like how many people convert to the agency from the email list. It just seems unreasonable. So, and I like to be quantitative. I like to, you know, have that, like how, how many email subscribers do we have? How many readers do we have? And how many like conversions, however we're defining that is, do we have is the conversion yeah to the course. Yes. I would say the conversion should probably be to the course. That being said, a thousand dollars is still a pretty big, it's still a pretty big week. Um, I mean, just think about yourself, right? Like let's say you're on an email list. Um, like who is an email? Like, do you have an email list that you like a newsletter that you like? Yeah, I have a bunch of them. Like let's say Brian Dean, because I think he's in a similar niche. Okay. So if, if you're like, if every week you're reading Brian Dean's uh, newsletter and you're like, Hey, I'm actually learning a lot from this guy and, but I'm not paying for it. Right. Like it's a free newsletter. So you're getting kind of quality information for free, which you should be providing by the way. Like, I think that's really important for an email list, but then how do you then make the leap to be like, Hey, I want to learn more about link building. The very first thing you buy, like, I think I don't know about you, but I would have a bit of like a, am I really going to get a thousand dollars worth of value from this? Right. Yeah. And so I think if you, if you have something even smaller than that, like, like even if you can do your first, I think a lot of people do this, you'll see that with giving out modules for free, right. If you can even do like a miniature course, that's just like that then perfectly moves into the, the larger course. At that point, you're already kind of priming people and they can, they can, they know what to expect and they're not going to have the same sticker shock. Are you paying, are are you charging for the mini course or is that like a free lead magnet? I'd probably charge, uh, people have more skin in the game when they pay for something. So I'd probably charge a a lower, a lower price, but like, think about Ramit Sethi, right? His Mm -hmm. courses are thousands of dollars, 500, $600,000. His book is $10, right? The majority of the people that find out about him, find out about him from, I will teach you to be rich, the book. And that's a much lower entry point. They know the basics and they're, there's a lot more people paying for that. And then he's kind of like letting people self-select into his higher priced offerings. Yeah. And they already know what he's talking. Like they already trust that he knows what he's talking about. Cause he, like they read a 200 page book that kind of, it's hard to fake it through that level of uh, commitment. So that's good. What, so back to the email course thing, I actually wrote a little, I'm, I'm trying to do more nurturing uh, kind of campaigns. Mm-hmm. So two things that I wrote recently 
um, during my unemployed week is one, I wrote <laughs> uh, a nurturing sequence in general. So um, I don't know if I have that up, but I, it's like six emails or something. So let's maybe plant a flag in the actual construction of this and just say like, I have this. Okay. So this is a nurturing sequence. What, what happens is somebody comes on the blog, they sign up for a uh, offer. So that could be like an editorial calendar template, and then they get a welcome email and then nothing happens. They just get like the monthly newsletter. So what does the welcome email say? Can I just stop you really quick? What is the, what's like the, what's the TTA and the welcome email? I have no idea. I didn't write any of them. Um, okay, cool. That was Ali and David for whoever made the offer basically writes that. So actually that's a good point is maybe we should audit those. Um, why? Is there something that you would put on welcome emails that like maybe we forgot like a best practice or. I mean, the, the point of a welcome email is to get you excited, right? You're like, I just, I entered this welcome email. It's like, you should get something right. Either it's, you know, um, like a reinforcement of why you joined this list of like, Hey, like, wait, so you know, they, people, they get what they downloaded though. Does it have to be more than that? Or is the, they get what they downloaded in, in the email, right? Yeah. So, we'll, you know, it'll be like a PDF for if it's an ebook or like an editorial calendar template, it'd be like a spreadsheet or something like that. And then, but then like the way that it's delivered, right. It should also, it should also say like, hi, welcome to this community. This is who we are. The fact that people don't know your agency, they could know that in a welcome email. Right. So like, um, you, you provide them with the thing that they came here for, but also take a moment to, to like, um, credential yourself, say, you know, Hey, like this is the omniscient team. You can even have that be like a plain text email from your team. It doesn't have to be anything like there's no bells and whistles. It doesn't have to be that way, but just more like, Hey, we're people. We like our passion in life or whatever is to, is to help people kind of connect with their audience. Um, like enjoy this, please reach out to us if you have any questions. That kind of humanizes your brand and also sets the, the context of like, now I'm part of this community as opposed to this, it, just a pure transaction. Um, get email, receive PDF, right? There's like, you're not kind of creating a relationship. Yeah. Could, could, could we look at this like an analogy could be like the about page on a website. Like it's kind of like a quick uh, interest capture to show like, Hey, we're real humans behind this company. Uh, here's what we believe. Here's what we do. Here's like maybe some top content or something like that. Is that like the frame with, with which we, sh- we should look at the welcome email in addition to obviously just giving the PDF or whatever they were promised? I would probably um, stick to one thing at a time. So I would say, yes, I think the about, the about emails, uh, the about page is a good example, but your, your, the goal of that email is to deliver the content and then to welcome this person, right? Like, Hey, excited to have you here. Here's a little bit about us. Looking forward to getting to know you. They ha- they've downloaded this PDF, and then if you have other content, that could be your next email. That's part of this like nurturing, right? It's like, hey, we hope you liked. Like, if you know what they downloaded, you could say like, hey, we hope you liked this PDF on this. Here's some other relevant things that we think you'll like, um, and then link out to those in your second email. And then now that way they're kind of trained to expect quality content that makes sense to them mm-hmm. from you. Can I show you? I-, I found one of our welcome emails. Sure. Oh man, I have this new laptop, so it might not let me really quick. Uh, I have to change it. <laughs> One second, I'll edit this out later, or maybe no not. Um, yeah, so we have a couple offers. One's like a traffic, uh, a content growth model template. Uh, fuck, I need to quit and reopen. Never mind. Um, I'll just tell you about it. So somebody signs up for an organic traffic forecasting model. It's like the spreadsheet they can make a copy of and basically input their keywords and their monthly search volume. So they get that and it says like, hey there, here's the uh, traffic model you requested with the link to it. And then it essentially asks a bunch of questions. So it's like, I'm curious, what are you hoping to accomplish by creating a growth model? Is it one of the following goals? And then it lists three goals. Um, or it could be totally something different. Feel free to respond to this email. We read all emails uh, and respond back. Uh, and then it's got like three tips to to create a growth model. Uh, and then it just says, you know, uh, keep an eye out for the next email. We'll we'll be in touch or something like that. Mm. Is that, I don't know. What do you think about that? And it's like the welcome email. Right off the bat, I would say that, that there's a lot going on. Like, do you, so you want them to like click the link and then also answer you and then also read like these tips, right? So you're kind of asking them to do a lot of things at once. And most, like the most successful emails 
have clear calls to action. What do you want? You want me to do like, here's what you want them to do in that email is just to download the PDF. Right. So mm-hmm. I'm just saying, like, I think this is the first, it's like, if you can, I don't want to get too technical, but if you, if you know, this is the first time that they've gotten something from you, it mm-hmm. could be a lot more like, Hey, really excited to have you like, um, you know, here at Omniscient, like, we love like our goal is to provide you with great content. Here's here's the first one of that. Here's the forecasting. And and then just leave it at the strip PDF, all the right? other stuff out of the first email. From this first email. Yeah, yeah. I would say show, like, show some personality, be like style and writing, but don't make it overly complicated and like a huge email. It's just that people don't know you. So Yeah, and they just want right. the the fucking template probably. Like, they want like the thing. I, don't, yeah. I don't care about all these questions. Like I don't want to respond to you. Like I just want that spreadsheet. Yeah. But once they got the spreadsheet, then you can, let's say like you can set a timer in the, in what, what do you guys use for your email marketing platform? HubSpot. Use, cool. Uh, so in HubSpot, you can, um, you can set like wait 24 hours and then send them another email. And that email will be like, Hey, hope you like the spreadsheet. Um, have a couple, I have a question for you. Like, is this like, wh- which one of these do you think is right for you? Like, let me know. And I'm happy to send you more free content if you're interested. And then, and then I like the line of like, Hey, we read every email because that further humanizes you and makes mm-hmm. it like you can have a conversation. If they don't answer, then you just wait a little while. Don't, 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 don't like overdo it. But then if there's something else that's related to that forecasting, right. That you think there's another 11 piece of content, you can slide into that inbox a week later and be like, Hey, here's another piece of content. Since you like, since you downloaded this forecasting thing, like, we think you'd like this. It's very, I mean, at the end of the day, like you're just talking to people, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like, what do you not like in your text? Like, you, you know that nobody likes to get double texted from somebody, right? Like you, if you feel, it makes you feel like you're kind of in the, um, now on you to respond. But for, but if you are kind of giving people their space and to being like, here's something I think you'd like, pretty cool. Let me know if you have any thoughts or concerns, like you're creating more of a, uh, like a back and forth. So you're building rapport. Right. And if you get a text back, it's kind of like a cue that, Hey, you can respond again. <laughs> but if it's just you sending texts, you should probably just stop texting. That's why email list hygiene is so important. Um, <laughs> and so, so similarly- if I could recap though, Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to recap and say like, all right, somebody signs up for a specific concrete offer. Um, what I heard is basically the first email is just give it to them, add some style if you'd like, you know, and maybe segment by like first time hearing from you and try to add a little more flair, but give them the thing. Uh, the second one is potentially add, um, some sort of like follow up, like how, I I don't remember exactly what you said, but do you have any questions about the content growth model? Please respond with questions. We'll, we'll read everything. And then if they respond. And if they don't respond, maybe there's like kind of a segmentation thing here. And uh, if they don't respond, maybe just follow up with the, uh, I guess this is where it gets a little unclear, but follow up with like a different piece of content that they might like even more, like a, maybe a webinar talking through like an on-demand webinar, talking through how to build a content growth model, which we have that on recording. We could do that one. And then if they do respond, then, you know, that, that could take it in a totally different direction, right? Because then that means they're a little more engaged. Yeah, exactly. The, yeah, I know what you mean about the, it gets a little tricky when someone doesn't answer you. Um, it's more so that you should take your foot off the gas, not necessarily that you need to stop talking to them all together, just because they didn't respond to one thing. Um, if they downloaded the PDF, that does indicate that they're interested. Like they, you've gotten an opt-in from a specific thing, but now you know what they like, you know what they were here for. So deliver them something that's, you know, congruent to that. So like what you mentioned about this webinar, it's like the webinar, webinar is on a similar topic. You can just shoot them an email and be like, hey, like, I hope that that forecasting PDF is working out for you. Let me know if you have any questions. In the meantime, like we created this webinar. I think you'd like it. Here you go. Let me like, and and that way, that way what you're doing is you're not, you're not pressuring people to engage with you. You're kind of just giving them value. And being could, like, we, could we pressure people to engage with that work? If we said like, uh, respond to this email, if you would like the webinar. And then if they don't respond, <laughs> I don't know. Like with that, is that like, um. Listen, at the end of like you can, you can test, all. you can test, right? That's the the beauty of email is you can run an A-B test. Mm-hmm. 50% of your cohort gets a webinar immediately. See what the opens and click-throughs are on that. 50% of it say, hey, reply back. See what the reply rate is. 
Like, mm. it, because everyone, people are different, you know, it's not like a one size fits all works for everybody. If you're finding that people are responding to you, you can, you can move over to that. My gut would probably say that that creates more friction, but yeah, probably I, am. I would want to test that and see. Okay. So that's interesting. All right. So this is sort of the, uh, the rocket ship taking off out of the stratosphere. <laughs> it's like basically the first point of contact and like kind of getting towards the point where we could potentially pitch them something. But we're not going to go deep into like a, a sales pitch, at least in the first two or three emails, it seems like. Yeah, I wouldn't. To the course, even. Um, we want to we want to make sure that they seem engaged and interested first and like kind of know and respect and trust us, especially if it's like a thousand dollar course. Maybe it would be different if we had like a ten dollar or hundred dollar email course, which I'll tell you about in a second, because I think we actually have something like that. Um, but I wrote a, a nurturing sequence that is pretty salesy. Um I think it's my direct response kind of conversion optimi- optimization in me. But it's it's hard for me to write without pushing something because I, I don't know. Just think every email should make money or something. So it's six emails long and mm-hmm. it starts out as being sort of diagnostic. I tried to follow like the um, what's the framework? ADA, a- awareness, interest, desire and action. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what we're selling is content strategy. The, that's like our bread and butter as an agency. We we have a good kind of portfolio framework, the barbell strategy. We typically can work with companies of all sizes because we can balance that framework in an interesting way. Whereas many agencies, they're, they'll either be really high end, which is like only enterprise companies can afford and get our ROI from, or there's like the lower end where they're basically hiring writers for like 50 bucks an article and it's just really shitty content. And that works for nobody, but we, we basically have a model that's pretty flexible there. And it's like based on strategy, right? So we go in and audit and do a SWOT analysis and all that stuff. Um, so, and the, cor- the course is also all about content strategy. So it's really aligned there. So I figure, all right, I'm going to start out and the subject line is here's what kills most content programs. And it's just kind of an educational email complete with the esoteric flair of my own kind of like philosophical interest. So I, I say, uh, 62% of marketers say their content strategy is good or excellent, but that's only because most don't know any better. It's like Pl- Plato's cave for marketers. They think what they're doing is great, but they're really just watching shadows dancing on the walls. Um, and then I kind of go in and say like, all right, there's going to be a point where you traffic plateaus. This isn't because you're not writing good content. This isn't because you're not doing content promotion. Like, you know, gurus will tell you it's because you don't have a smart content strategy. Um That's just, I don't link to anything in that email. It's literally just like kind of a diagnostic and it's saying like content strategy is the thing you're overlooking. Email two is, uh, it says content strategy isn't actually what you think it is. (laughs) And then I go in and explain like the difference between tactics, strategies, goals, and all that stuff and how most marketers confuse them. And here's, here's what an actual strategy looks like. Um, so it's kind of meaty. It's like, 800 words or something like that. And I I talk about a couple different models of content strategies. So like there's the Walmart content strategy model, which is like you overlook the most crowded areas and deliberately go to rural areas in terms of keywords. So you go for like these really like untapped low keyword difficulty terms and essentially scale those out as fast as possible. And all of a sudden you've got this massive snowball of keywords that you rank for that your competitors Mm -hmm. didn't even look at. There's the HubSpot model where you try to rank for every keyword, no matter if it's business related or not, and hope that someday you'll get customers from that. Uh, and then there's the barbell strategy. So I basically go all like deep dive on strategy. Mm-hmm. And then email number three, sorry if this is way too detailed. I wish I could show you this stuff, but this is, this is the sales email sequence that I was very proud to write last week. Um, number three is it says three minute content strategy lesson. And it literally just walks through nine bullet points and says exactly how we do content strategy, which I don't know if that seems bullshitty or not, because it's like, it's very hard to give somebody a checklist for like what we do for clients for like $10,000, but it it just lists out step-by-step. And I'm like, I I know this is simplified, but you know, I'm, I'm writing an email, not a book. And if you want to learn how to really do content strategy, uh, we have a course for this. And that's where I first pitched the course. Um, and then email four, I really, really pitch it. I say like three benefits, uh, and then like, I I give a testimonial from one of the students email number five. Um, it's another pitch (laughs) I do, I do, uh, it's like before taking the course and after uh, like the broke woke type thing, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Um, and then the sixth one, I, it's the last one and it's, it's gives them a discount. 
So it's like 25% off, but like the last three are like hard pitches. So anyway, the point of all of this is that this is like a hard, it's like a sales pitch and nurturing funnel. Is this useful or like, <laughs> we haven't employed this yet. So it, <laughs> I don't want to be this like classic marketing. That's just like, it depends. I, I, the thing <laughs> is, I would say like for your email marketing strategy, I would, I would start right with, um, with CTAs. Like if you build an email and I can even show you, um, I don't know, it's not probably not going to be, do you, I think you disabled screen sharing. Can you let me, can I show you something? Yeah. How do I do that? Advanced. Oh, oh. um, oh yeah. I think you should be able to now. Okay. So this is an agency that, that runs, um, rebrands, right? So they run like your content strategy and then they help you rebrand. And so this is their first email. And this is this, mind you, I did not sign up for a specific piece of content. So what we were talking about earlier, which is like the delivery vehicle for the first one that still stands. But in this first email, what they're doing is taking like one, they have a personalized um, note at the beginning, right? They're saying, hey, we're here to make your life easier. So stay tuned. Then what they did is they compiled all of their best introductory content. And it seems like what you have, what you created, right? Like what you're talking about, the Walmart strategy, the HubSpot strategy, it's like that could potentially be a blog post in and of itself. It's like, well, how people tend to run their content strategy and like why they're doing it wrong. And then what you could do is create like this CTA right here that says read more. It doesn't just function as a way to get them on site. It also lets you track with what, what's happening. Like you, if somebody, you're not going to know based on your email, if someone read the whole thing and it resonated with them, mm. but if they click this and go to the blog post, you will have data knowing that they converted off of the messaging that you had that like, you can see where they clicked and you know that that's the one that got them. Mm-hmm. Then the other element I want to call out here is that this has that they, so they, they run branding, but they also have high ticket, like many thousand dollar uh, sticker price. So they have a, how to create a brand strategy for free. And at the bottom here, it says, do you need help with your own content? Let's talk. And oh, this so that's what I was the- talking about. That's like the little subtle thing yes. at the bottom that most yes. people probably will never even see. And the ones that do, then like, maybe we can sell the agency through that. Exactly. But then the other thing is, so let's say you click through on, Ooh, well, this is old, but let's say you can click, you click through on this, uh, how to create a brand strategy, right? Then the next email that this person gets, you can, you can essentially somehow tag this user. Like you can say, if they clicked on this link, send them a different email than the other people. Because let's say this per this uh, link is the one that you've identified as kind of your highest intent because they clearly want to build a brand strategy. So then this this person can get kind of a more aggressive next email, right? Mm. Than the other people who are clearly mm. more like fence sitters about like what they're interested in doing. And those people, you can just keep giving them more content. You can be like, hey, how about this? Um, and then you can, you, they just need a little bit more nurture than someone else might. So the, um, yeah, this is personalization. It's like a choose your own adventure, but like, exactly. do you, would you recommend like deliberately choosing, let's say, cause they had three links to articles there. Mm-hmm. Would you choose three links that sort of like, uh, imply three different intent stages? So one could be, I don't know what the top intent would be. It would be maybe how to create a content strategy or I don't know, like the most, the most high, high intent one. And that's the one that gets that sales sequence from the, the nurturing sequence that I just kind of read to you. And then the other two are lighter ones. It's like, or maybe it could even be like persona based, maybe because we have a couple of pieces that are like how to work with writers, which would kind of imply that you're like a, a, a managing editor or like a, a content marketing manager or something like that. Um, but it, it, forget the specifics. You're, you're saying that like yeah, yeah. you can do this and like basically that tells you something about the person who clicked on that link. 100%. That's that's kind of, I think the big, the beauty of email marketing is that you can, you can craft pathways for people and understand who they are based on what is resonating with them. Right. So like where they click will now inform what they're interested in. It tells you who they are and you can, and that's kind of like what the point of segmentation and personalization is, it's like based on who they are, you can deliver them better experiences 
you're also ensuring a higher conversion rate because you know, kind of like, I know, for example, that like what you would be interested in, because I know you as a person, but like similarly through your emails, you'll, you can also kind of create the, the, the right experience for them. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I think this is probably the right way to do things. I, I always struggle because we have a small email list now and it's like, you know, is the, the marginal effort required to do this worth the marginal utility of doing mm-hmm. so. And it seems like it is because we probably learn something from the audience too. And like about our audience, like that would probably w- be worth it enough. But um, in terms of like, you the don't ta- uh, have to do a ton of extra work. I just want to be clear. Like you don't have to mm-hmm. personal. I think some people fall into this trap where they like hyper segment and hyper personalize. And that works for like larger companies and a lot of people on their list, with a lot of different offerings, but like, it seems like y'all have to identify what your kind of core offerings are, which seems like you have, and then figure out based on the, like, kind of like the lead scoring of this, right? It's like, Hey, I am interested in this forecasting tool. I'm the, like that then leads them into this, down this funnel to buy this kind of lower weight course to eventually help them buy the, the full priced course. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I definitely don't want some like weird looking decision tree of like just a thousand different marketing automation rules to start or event. I I never, like that just sounds horrible. So that sounds like we have to hire like a whole team to manage that. No, you definitely don't need to do that. It's it's more so just understanding like, you know, you're not going to sell someone a Ferrari if you don't know them. Like you have to, you know, you have to like get them primed and they have to, they have, you have to build mutual trust. It's like, you don't want to work with somebody that you don't, that you don't think you can help and they don't want to work with you. So how do you kind of identify who those people are based on the things they're telling you they want and based on the actions they're taking? Yeah, this is unrelated to what we were just getting. I'm obsessed with the offer thing and the escalation of offers. Do you think there's a case to be made for somebody who would be a good fit for our agency, but actually wouldn't want to take a course? And how would we learn that? Yeah, I mean... I am not a course person personally. Like I just, I don't do a lot of, I'm like, I just speak for myself. I'm not a good independent learner, right? Like I like to work with people. Um, and so if you offered me a course, I would probably, I probably wouldn't convert off of that. So this that is means- perfect. This is you then. It's like, yeah. you're not qualified for the course, but we work with you like on an agency basis. So like, if right. you're on this email list, what, what brings you to that point? Yeah. I mean, I would still look at your course and still be like, oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't buy your course, probably. But if then, like, but I am more likely to convert off of this 15 minute call, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think like you can also have what you had at the bottom, like what I showed you at the bottom of this column five email, which is like interested in working with us, book a free, book a free call. Like, and I think that the the person who is not the not the course person is gonna go for that. If they're, if they're still like a hot lead. Do you, th- do you think we should put that at the bottom of like every email just for the hell of it? 100%. Cause just like, what's the, the downside? Yeah. Interested in working with us? Click here. That's, you know, and then, um, or you can, or you could even have a different, you could try AB testing with a different footer with like social proof, which is like, right. you know, yeah, but related saw, to the agency like, pitch. Yeah. Read this we case helped, study on AppSumo content marketing or something like yeah, that. They we click helped AppSumo like, grow oh, that's cool. 350%. Read more here. They, you could even do that. Like you could even have a, you know, we help them get the, these results, read more about that. And then in the case study, you can have a pop-up that's that's uh, about booking a call. Like once somebody has already read the social proof. It does sound like a, a, a compelling case study. So we should really write that. <laughs> you really should. <laughs> Um, we'll do that. That sounds good. I think implicit in all of this is that the content's good. Cause like for me, like, I feel like I'm sometimes learning like marketer one-on-one kind of stuff. Not that this is one-on-one. I think this is clearly valuable and like a lot of stuff I didn't know, but sometimes like all I want to do is just write and make good shit and just tell people about it. And I know like it's, it, it kind of is that simple sometimes, it's but it's also doing. not that simple, you know, because like you do have to think about like the stages and like who they are and all that stuff. Cause for me, I'm like, I just want to write some good articles and then be like, Hey, buy the course. Like it's great, you know, and expect people to just be like, I expect, I don't know, in my mind, it's like, they're already there, but I mean, frankly, I feel like more people can infuse personality into their emails. Like, I feel like I'm being honest, like, I feel like the email that you sent me, that you read to me, the the welcome email, like didn't really have y'all's personality in it. Right. Like you guys are fun. Like I enjoy working with you a lot of like largely in part for the results. Yes. But also for the human experience of it. 
And so I think like speaking to people like people really does stand out in an inbox. Yeah. That's, I mean, just good copywriting and by advice in general or content writing. I actually, this is a totally different tangent, but I did a job ad for uh, like person, like my personal blog. I'm doing mm-hmm. these like MarTech articles, like the best email marketing software and stuff like that. I'm trying to make some affiliate revenue. So I put a pro blogger job post out and I wasn't thinking about it much. I'm just like, all right, I always do kind of brown M&M's clauses, which is like kind of detail oriented uh, selection filters. So like use this exact subject line, say your favorite album of all time, which is also mm-hmm. a good one because I got this whole playlist of like great albums now. Um, so I did all that stuff, but then like the actual job description was just really informally written. Like, I think I used the word shit in it. Mm-hmm. It was just like me talking, like there was no filter. I didn't edit it at all. And the responses like, I were amazing. Like they were entertaining. People opened up. Like, it was like, Oh, I'm so glad. Like, this isn't like a formal job listing. And like, they actually like, it felt more honest from them too. And I was like, oh, 100%. we should do this with everything. Like, just like be ourselves. Well, that's a, that's just a classic like <laughs> mom giving a preteen advice, which is like be yourself. But it's it's true, right? Like the the thing is, like, I think people when they're first starting out with an agency, it's like you don't get to be that selective, right? You're like trying to build up a client base, but then and you want to make sure that you're like professional and buttoned up and people trust you, right? But it's like, but then you'll notice that as soon as people start getting successful, they kind of become more informal. Right. And like mm-hmm. that, because people resonate with that informal, like they, they resonate with people. They don't resonate with like, with suits. <laughs> and so, especially in this kind of like this ecosystem where you're working with um, startups, and you're working with like small businesses, medium sized businesses, like they want to know that they're working with people who care about them. And they care about their results. And so like, I, 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 I'm, I'm a big proponent of speaking to people like you're, you're friends with them, especially if you're going to work with them one-on-one because mm-hmm. you want them to know who you are. You, you want them to, to trust you because, you know, a lot of times like their website, they're, their baby, like they have a lot of attachment to the, to the success of it. And if they trust you as a person and your emails and all of your marketing really is just a conduit for your voice. Like, how do you, how do you shine through and, and yes, offer like the, the social proof and offer the, let the quality of the work speak for itself, but also the, the vessel it comes in is your, is your personality and your brand. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This, this is kind of opening like a whole new topic, which is like, I, I feel like in, early in my career, I used to do that where like, I would kind of read, I don't know, like how to do things. I, I would try to mimic like how I thought other people you know, we're supposed to do these things, like even in job Mm -hmm. interviews. Mm -hmm. And then like, as I I grew and it's a a function of confidence, I think confidence in like knowing who you actually are, but it's confidence because what I realized was I'm selecting the other person just as much as they're selecting me. So by diluting myself and acting like as other people, I'm actually like not, I'm not doing my job in selecting the right person to work for the right client to work for, like all of that stuff too. So I feel like when, when you, I don't know, be authentic. It sounds, it sounds so cheesy. Like what you're doing is you're, you're attracting like-minded people and like-minded companies. And without doing that, you end up diluting your own value and your own kind of unique value proposition or unique style or whatever it is. And just like accepting whoever comes in through that, like, I don't know, artificial, like whatever formal copy you thought you were supposed to write. It's like, that's not yeah. resonating in the same way that like, if you were to just like let loose and like kind of be your own, your own yeah, brand. Yeah, 100%. Or it's like what they say. It's about, it's like what you, what you say no to is more important than what you say yes to. Right. Like how do you, and, and it's, it's true. Oh my God, dude. Whenever I see emails that I wrote when I was 18, I, <laughs> I will say things like, please advise in my email. Yeah. It's like, as like a child. It's it just, doesn't, it doesn't even sound I, like me. Like when yeah, I look back at those. Yeah. Um, it's because I didn't know who I was and I thought that I, I was trying to play grown up, you know? And it's, it's, and I also think obviously like the, the landscape for business is changing too, mm, right? 100%. Like you don't have to, you don't have to be a, a businessman, like what they show in kids books. Like there's, there are plenty of people that are really brilliant and really like to have results that don't, don't dress the part or, or talk like that. It's like, and, and I think that people are recommending that and they are a lot more likely to engage with a human. Um, mm. On the flip side, though, what bothers me even more than people who, because like, we're kind of looking at this axis of like formality versus informality, or at least that's how I kind of implied this. Um, so like if you're informal, being formal, whatever, it's boring, but the opposite bothers me so much more. Like when brands try to be like cheeky and, and quirky and like right in the that, other, ch- I, I call it chatty day. copy. 
I, so whoever runs, you know, Michael's, the craft store. Yeah. yeah. Michael's. They, whoever runs their email marketing is I think like a Gen Z and they'll say things, their emails will go like, well, we'll literally have subject clients. They go, yes. And I'm like, you know, you're Michael's, right? Like, you know, you guys sell frames right? Like, it's just like a, it feels like a mismatch with their brand. Um, and it just like, yeah, those things always do seem kind of like, um, like they're just trying to, like they had a meeting and they were like, how do we get, yeah. Millennials? How do we appeal to the youth? How do we it's get so the silly? Youth? Like, cause you can tell like it's, there's no like leading indicator. Like there's no like universal indicator that it's like bullshit, but like, I feel like you can tell like when somebody's being un- inauthentic or like a brand is inauthentic, but it's yeah. also like time and place too. Like I, I, it always bothered me when it, you know, my background is kind of conversion optimization, but like when you would, uh, produce an error on like a form field and it would say something like whoopsie daisy like yeah, yeah it's yeah. okay like we still love you and it's like oh, this is making me even more frustrated but it works <laughs> for some companies like i've seen some good like 404 pages there's like that one where it looks like john travolta and he's kind of just like looking around like he's just like doesn't like you know he's kind of lost and it's like i've seen that as a 404 like that like, one, yeah. that's, that's that a fun good. 404 page like that's you know and it's it, but it has to work for you it has to be like authentic to your brand right similar yeah if it was like like dell Dell dell.com or like salesforce you'd be like get the fuck out of here but if it was like noah's website like i I feel like yeah it's like that that feels right and it's like that's that's right like that that's honestly the the advice is like figure out who you guys are and then have have your content be true to you and it's like that's what's what's easy about that is that it's just you writing it like you don't you don't have to sound like anyone else you just have to sound like you yeah. So, all right. Back to email stuff. I feel like I've learned a bunch already. We've got the offer escalation, which I'm I'm going to tap back into now. But uh, uh, I, in, in summary here. Oh, yeah. Sorry. What's up? Sorry. I have a two o'clock. So I have to. Oh, no. I just realized. <laughs> <laughs> we can do a part two. Can we just. Yeah. Can we do a part two? That would be. That would be great. Let's, yeah. Let's do a part two. All right. Do you remember <laughs> what we talked about last time? No. <laughs> the core parts we talked about in, in terms of your advice were um, to rewrite the emails to have more personality and be more authentic. Yep. We had described kind of our welcome emails and they seemed kind of generic or bland. So that was one big thing. And then the big one in combination with that was less on tone and, and more on reducing the information. So we had like six paragraphs and you're like, all right, cut that down. It's a welcome email. They just want what they signed up for. Yeah. So I think that's just a best practice is to have like one thing per email or like one CTA. Yep. And with that addendum is we can also have a programmatic and subtle agency CTA at the footer. And yeah. that can kind of be a complimentary thing like that. That's just like a, in case you're interested, in case you're qualified, here's an easy link to just get to like our AppSumo case study, which we just talked about, or, um, you know, just a demo or like a, a, a free consultation or something like that. And it's not for everybody. So maybe like the, the actual CTA is something like by the course, but like that, that CTA is always at the bottom and it's very subtle. So those were kind of, t- were, is that accurate? Yeah, I think that's a, I would keep your, I would keep your bottom CTA to be that 15 minute consulting, right? Like want to talk with us, right? 15 minutes complimentary consultation. Um, I think that the AppSumo case study, for example, that's a great email in and of itself, right? So the, mm. and it doesn't have to be, it could be part of your nurturing sequence where it's like, first you're introducing somebody via the content. And then let's say you're following up with some actionable tips. And then this is kind of like your social proof email, right? You'll see a lot of companies do this with like, um, they'll send an email with just like a picture from their Instagram and, or just a customer review. And so it'll be a compilation of reviews that is basically telling the audience that they can trust you. But what you can do with the AppSumo case study, for example, is because it's going to be fairly long and you can just say like how, you know, how omniscient help like three X or 300 X, whatever it is, um, AppSumo's organic traffic. And then that way you could do a little bit of backstory, like, Hey, AppSumo's digital marketplace. Like we started working with them at this point. And then here's some key stats, right? Like, and then it's like, find out what we did. Mm-hmm. And the CTA could be uh, like, it could encourage people to read more. And then within the case study, that's where, you know, you guys come in. the demo or something. Yeah. Content upgrades. Right. Which is like, like I said, and I'm sorry to keep repeating this, but it's like the whole point of the email is to get you to the website. So it's like, and then you know what to do when you're on the website, right? That's like where you guys specialize. And so the, how do you get people to go to your website? And then you kind of craft the experience from there. Yeah. Okay. So I don't understand what a nurturing sequence is. I don't think so. Like, 
<laughs> when when do we send this case study? Um, I, there's the point at which somebody signs up for our email list, and that's for like an ebook or an offer, or just for the email list. Is yeah. it right after that, or is it after they become a course customer, or is it like after they you know sign up for a certain offer that suggests that they're willing to like be a agency client, or like what you know when when does that email come? When does that nurturing sequence come? What the hell's a nurturing sequence? I don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So basically like a nurturing sequence. Okay. So let's say like you got their email, right? Then you get the email, like the, you send them the email with the thing, right? You, it's just a little bit, um, aggressive to go from sending, let's say one email to now sending like now being like, and you're ready to buy. Mm -hmm. Right. So what you can do is like send the content, right? If they opened it and then a couple of days later, you can send them another piece of content. Like the, the goal of the nurturing is basically like you're pulling trust triggers to make them feel like they're getting value from your email list, right? Let me ask, let's, let's use a specific example. Um, so they come to the website, there's an article on how to create an SEO editorial calendar. There's a template that they can basically download, but they have to give their email for that. So they sign up, they get a kickback email that's automated. That gives them the SEO editorial calendar on like a Google spreadsheet. That's the only thing we put in the first message. Then a couple of days later, we follow up and say, hey, uh, blah, 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 blah. Here's another piece of content. Is that a blog post? Is that like another gated piece of content? Um, is it like, should we escalate that in terms of like, should that be like a, a deeper uh, asset, like a webinar, you know, like where it kind of requires more, uh, more of their effort or yeah. What's that second email? The second email is like the tricky part for me is like, how do you follow up to the thing they asked for? Yeah. So I think like based on what it is that they asked for, right. You should identify what problem they have. And then that piece of content is like the first solution. But then the next time, like you're emailing them, you know, the heads, like who they are, basically, you have a little bit of information about what they're trying to do. So then you just give them another relevant thing and talk to them as if you're trying to solve their problem. Right. So if like, mm-hmm. if it's the, give me the example of, of the actual upgrade. The first one or the second one. The first one would be like an editorial calendar, or it could be like a content brief or some sort of template. Or it could just be like an email list sign up or something like that. But in any case, they're going to get like the welcome email that includes that asset. Yes. So then, so let's say like they, they get that asset. The next time you email them, you're essentially like refining who they are based on all of the other things you have and then sending them another piece of relevant content. So like, because you liked this, right. Here's another piece of relevant content, but you want them to take an action each time. Right. So like the first time you're like, here, open this. The second time you're like, here's some additional relevant information. And if you want to learn more, you can, you can attend this webinar, for example, Mm, right. But like you want them to take an action each time. And then based on whether or not they're taking actions, right. So you, you, then that's where you start having your a little bit of that segmentation, which I know you get overwhelmed by, (laughs) but like, it's just like, basically like, yes, no. Right. Hey, did you open this? If yes, that means like, you're clearly interested in what I'm giving you. And then you're kind of qualified for the next thing. If no, then maybe I can ease up or give you something a little bit more beginner or more eye-catching, more like generalist, right. Something that most people would be interested in. Um, and then, or to me, if someone consistently doesn't open emails, that either indicates that they join this email list for one specific thing and are just not really that interested in being on the email list, or like that first thing wasn't relevant for them. Mm-hmm. And then, then you can try something else, right? You have other you have potentially other options, try like a different content upgrade and then see if that works, right? Some people are just not good fits for your email list. They thought it was something else or they thought they were interested. Like I signed up for a lot of newsletters that I thought I would really like, and then just never really felt like engaging with them. And that's nothing wrong with the newsletter. It's just like, I wasn't the right fit for that. Yeah. So that would be, um, if they don't open the emails or if they don't click through, then it's like, we have a, a Hail Mary of sorts to like re-engage them. And mm-hmm. then if that doesn't work, we just take them off the email list or something. Like we don't want to you know, clog up the, the, whatever, <laughs> you know, I, I think like deliverability and, and stuff like that suffers if, if people aren't opening your emails. So we'd want to like clean it up and spruce those or, you know, take those people out or. 
Yeah, I think the 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 benchmark that I would use is 120 days. So if somebody okay. hasn't engaged with you in six months, there's just really no reason for them to be on your list unless you're doing like a big sale, right? Unless you're doing something that's just like they could potentially be interested in, um, but they're kind mm. of not interested in your regular full price offerings. But let's say you're doing a big sale or like you're doing some kind of like a big free thing, then you can kind of broaden that out a little bit. You could do 180 days or something. And and um, and then that way, and then if they still don't answer that, I would just cut them right out of the list. It I, seems inactive at that point. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that a bloated list is one of the most frustrating mm-hmm. things when it comes to email marketing. People really like having a big list. Um, it seems but, like a vanity metric at a certain point. It's like a, a leading indicator of your efforts, but like the total list size seems like total traffic where, yeah, it's like a bigger number could indicate that more people are going to sign up, but not necessarily. Right. And if you look, if you think about like, you know, for working with an influencer, for example, their number of followers is a, it's a leading indicator, but the, the most important thing is the engagement of those followers. If you have a hundred thousand followers and getting a hundred likes in your photos, that means that like you either probably bought them or they're just not, they're just not engaged. Like they're not here for your content. And so that first number only really matters if it matches up with the second. Okay. Well, I like that heuristic, the 120 day, 180 day, that gives me something, you know, we can set up an automation sequence in HubSpot for that. If they're inactive to like basically take them off the list after that point. Um, I'm thinking in specific still in, in terms of like this decision tree where it's like email number one is always going to be a welcome and give them what they signed up for, whether that's like the email content. list, a download, whatever. Yep. Second one is going to be like an escalation. It's going to be something a little bit more involved, but definitely something they can take action on. We'll yeah, probably another, do an on-demand webinar, honestly. I would say like another piece of content, like educational, but with like the, the whole point of that content is like, you want to delight the person on your email list. You want them to be like, yep, this is high quality information and I'm happy that I'm here. Yeah. We, uh, we have really in depth, like screen share kind of webinar stuff that I think if, if you aren't a fan of that stuff, it's, it's probably not a fit, you know, or I guess that would be practitioner level stuff, but we'll, we'll think through that. That we're going to give something of value the second time. And then let's say, so the people who don't open, maybe they get sent on a different trajectory where they're like just on the email list, you know, maybe they just get like the once per month newsletter. Yeah. And then the second one is like the people who, who, you know, implicitly say yes on both of those. Yeah. Then there's the third email. Should we send like the AppSumo case study or something like that? That's a little bit more of an escalation. Yeah. Some people would say that, that you, you can go right into sales there. I would say social proof is a better, is a better tactic because it's like you're putting the, you're putting like numbers to what you're saying to like, to the content, right? So like, first you're like, Hey, I really like this content. This is interesting. And now you're saying, well, here's how it works for other people. And then, but in that AppSumo case study within the, within the actual website is when you should have the kind of upgrades to be like interested in doing this, like work with us. Mm-hmm. Right. And then that way you can have a little bit more of a, of like an, I would say a little bit more aggressive an approach of, of like now now they're interested in potentially becoming customers. And then from okay. there, that's where I think more of like your outbound engine can start taking place. So if somebody has been like interested in all three of those and like downloading, then you can start being like, we can hey, do I account based stuff. We can look at like what, what company they're coming from, what company size, exactly. like what their position is, reach out like manually and be like, Hey, I saw you enjoy this webinar and case study. We'd love to, you know, get you on the phone for 15 minutes and tell you how we yeah. can basically do this for your company. Exactly. But that shouldn't be automated. It seems like, at least not now. It, it seems like that would be technically pretty hard to automate because you'd have to like pull in the information from like, I don't know, Zoom Info or Clearbit or something like that. And then set up like triggers. And it seems like for now with our email list size, it's like, just look at the people who say yes on all those three and like send a manual email if it fits kind of our, our MQL yeah, criteria. It's a size thing. So like at a certain point, it might just become unreasonable for you guys to, to do that for that right person. And at that point, you could just have a plain text email from you that's automated. That's just like, hey, I saw that you like looked at this case study. Like, I'd love to see how we can help you. And then, you know, pull in their company name. But I think you're right. I think for now, like you could just do your own kind of like lead scoring and be like, oh, this is this is a good fit. And I know they're a good fit because um, they've kind of taken action to indicate to me that they're that they're interested and, you know, their position and their company and something that we can we can help with. Um, and then that is also that's an important time for like for you to sound like a real person, which I know that mm. you know how to do. but 
I think so many of those emails get ignored, even if I've like been engaging with your, with your stuff. And I feel like I, you know, I've read a lot of like HubSpot articles, but then all of the outbound emails felt like salesy. And so I don't really respond to those. The ones that I respond to, I had, did I tell you this? I had like, we did talk about this. I had the best like SDR um, experience Mm -hmm. and it was like, they put effort in, they actually knew they, they like looked up how to say my name and they like did a little bit of research of the company and saw that I was usually promoted and like noted all of those things in like a way that didn't feel like they were plug and play, like throw like, um, mail merging information, you know, how so, do they look up how to say your name? They just did like a, how to pronounce. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. He, like he like sent me a video. It was just like, Hey, Alona. He's like, I really hope I didn't butcher that. I spent a lot of time looking that up, um, which I don't know why we spent a lot of time, but <laughs> it, it was like those kinds of it sounded personalized. It sounded like he put the attention to detail into it that signified, Hey, this is not just like a mass blast, you know? Exactly. Nothing worse than like, I was looking at your website and saw this piece of, it's like very, it feels like, well, I'm not going to respond to this because you didn't even you didn't even put any time into this email, you know, <laughs> there was one. Um, yeah, I guess I can share this. This my friend Louise got an email from HubSpot when I was working at HubSpot. This is the first couple months and it was completely cold. So I don't think he had signed up for any list. And it was like, dear sir or madam, yeah. <laughs> it legit said that. And he forwarded to me. He's like, is this, is this real? I'm like, yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> so I, had, I had to like forward that. And I'm like, Hey, th- this is not cool. You know? Yeah. A hundred percent. The, yeah, I think the most, the most effective, um, from a company you can get away with obviously having your own like brand voice and you could have a more like stylized email that doesn't look like it's sent to you personally. No one thinks that you're like out here designing HTML emails to send to you personally. But when you start switching over into having more of like a conversational tone where you're doing more like, you know, B2C, like you're talking to people, then it's definitely like does not bode well in your favor to sound like a robot. Nobody. Yeah. Wrong. We'll, we'll be fine with that. I think we're pretty good at like manual one-to-one sales. So like, I'm not worried about that. It's just, we're going to have to come up with criteria and basically set up triggers to like alert us when somebody goes through those three escalating steps, of like basically, you know, implicit interest in those email flows. Um, beyond the sales question, because I know it's like difficult to sell somebody to an agency contract from an email list. Mm -hmm. We talked about the course. The course is about a thousand bucks. We might be able to, you know, do a smaller offer, like a book or like a a email course or something like that for like 10 to a hundred. Disregarding that, do you think after these three emails, after the AppSumo case study, we could launch into like a a programmatic automated uh, three email sequence? Like the thing I read to you on part one, where it was like, uh, I can't remember the exact flow. It was like six or seven emails, which I probably wouldn't do. But, um, you know, like what is content strategy? I don't know if that's the right one. Anyway, three emails where it deliberately pitches the course and explains, hey, we have an agency. If you're interested, you know, talk to us here. But if you're not interested in the agency, we actually have a course that teaches exactly how we did this for AppSumo and blah, blah, blah. Here it is. I don't know. Yeah, I think you absolutely you absolutely can do that. Um, I think and I'm just going to speak, this is my personal opinion from like, from my experience, I think that it's better to give out free information. So like, let's say you take the first module of your course, which is let's say like the SWOT analysis and you just Mm -hmm. send an email and you're like, how to can like, basically like know who your competitors are. Right. But like, that's the subject line. And then you just kind of walk through really basic stuff. It's like, Hey, like I can, this is the framework. And then it's like, and if you're interested in learning more about this and like, and building on these tactics, like we have this course and, and then just pitching it, but giving something in the email. Like, I think that's oftentimes super salesy emails don't give you anything. And so you think that you have to buy it to get something, but you don't, you don't know what you want to buy until you try it. Right. So that's like why free trials are so popular because people want to be able to actually play around and, and, you know, touch and feel the thing. And so I think even if you turn some of that content into an email, like, and just gave away some of it, like a piece of it um, for free, that's valuable. And then someone could even like learn something from the email. I think they're more likely to then buy the course. Okay. I like that. So I'm writing this down as we go. So in terms of like the email flow, it's like the welcome email, the escalation email, value add with content. 
the social proof, uh, app yeah. case study type thing. And then number four, I'm calling the sneak peek. So it's like another value add, but it's actually like something from the product course or service that we can use to basically say, Hey, here's a taste. Um, and it's not completely a sales pitch, but it, obviously it alludes to the fact that we have this. Um, and then can we follow up to that with something that kind of pushes on a different angle? Uh, maybe it's like testimonials from the course. Maybe it's like a harder sales pitch. You know, what yeah, would you do most, after like the sneak peek? The most effective thing that you could do is discount. And like, you could, you could always, you know, I don't want to discount. You could always inflate your price and then discount it. <laughs> it's the classic info classic. marketer play. I know. But the reason that <laughs> this so course is worth nine ninety nine ninety nine, but yeah, we're selling it I for two ninety seven just for you. Yeah, I see for sure. But I think if Haps, if Hapsumo has taught me anything is that people love a FOMO, right? Really, like they really love FOMO. Like they they don't want to be missing out on potential pricing. And so what it's like, some people will even do this where it's like, Hey, early bird is sold out, but there's like a next tier. That's like, this is, we're mm. going to close this price point at the end of the week. We do, we actually are going to do that. So we're going to do a V2 of the course. Uh, okay. We've launched an app sumo. We're trying to squeeze additional sales out of V1, but we're going to do a revamp like later in the summer, probably or, or fall, depending on like what, what our priorities are. And we will increase the price because it's going to be like a bigger, better course, right? So like, I think there is this window because I, I hate the idea of artificial scarcity. I hate those bullshit tactics. So I don't, I, I can't live with myself and do that. Yeah. Um, you know, I can't say like there's limited seats. It's a digital product. There's not limited seats. We're not closing the course. I but I do think that like, if we get them in before the window where we like actually put, you know, another hundred hours into this thing and another hundred hours of our value, then we could use that as sort of a window like that. So is that kind of what you're, is, does that fall in line with that? Yeah, that makes sense. I, I agree with you. I also find that like the, the false scarcity to be yikesy. Um, unfortunately, and like, I'm not, it's, it's, you know, I'm not trying to tell you to do spammy things to sell. It's more like when there isn't any kind of, when there isn't like a time sensitivity, it's almost like people could always just say, Oh, I'll just buy this later. Like I can, you can always justify making the purchase later. And yeah. a lot of companies and a lot of businesses do not discount and do not, and like are able to do it without that um, impetus, but it's, it, it is, it does drive the urgency more if there is some sort of a special offer and that special offer doesn't have to be spammy. It could be like, additional content that you're giving out for free for a limited time for mm. example. So like you can write an you could have an ebook or something that you're like, "Hey, and like we're going to add this tool in if you buy it in the next 2 weeks." And that way you're not doing anything negative to your users. You're not artificially inflating your price. You're not um pretending like there's limited seats. What you're doing is being like, "Hey, like I'd like to, you know, fill fill some spots now. And the way that I want to do that is by giving them like kind of an extra thing. What if we did a uh, uh, one hour consult, not consultation, I guess that's not the right word, but strategy session with mm -hmm. one of the founders where they can ask us any questions about the course for like up to um, like 180 days after they sign up or something. So it's, you know, it's time capped. It's not going to be like six years down the line or something. Um, Cause that actually could be capped. Like that's something that I don't have unlimited hours. So we actually could cap that at like 20 people that get that. And that could be added in as a bonus. Like if you sign up, you know, within whatever time span yeah. from that email that they get that, I feel like that, that would be kind of interesting. The other thing you could do, like I've seen people do this, but like, you know, not to pitch AppSumo, but like one thing people do is like they'll buy seats at like an AppSumo, like an AppSumo product, right? Like something that, because we have a lot of products for agencies. And so you'll buy kind of like client facing seats and then you can give out seats to certain software mm. as part of your mm. course. So let's say like there's content marketing. Like Ahrefs software, or something. Ahrefs, Rank Math, whatever, whatever you use, you could also just be like, hey, and if you join now, we'll also give you access to the software for free. And that way you're kind of like, you're kind of like um, accelerating their own progress by by boosting what they're able to do with your course. All right. That's fucking genius. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm calling this step value add slash urgency. And I wrote down, that's actually a brilliant idea, buying seats from a software uh, product. Because we do in the course, we actually use Ahrefs and ClearScope and a couple others to illustrate the lessons because they're our favorite tools. That's what we use. We give recommendations for free tools if they want to use them, but really like your best case is using like the, you know, best in breed industry tools. So I actually feel like that would be a really cool value add is buying like 20 or 30 seats. And, you know, we're friends with the AHRA, Ahrefs people, the ClearScope people. Maybe we could even get a discount or something on yeah. those like bulk seats. Maybe. And then that would be a time or like a, a, a 
limitation. Like that would actually be like a physical limitation on how many seats we could sell. And the limitation is positive as opposed to. Yeah. It's like we're giving hundreds, negative, yeah. if not thousands of dollars in value for sure. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you, if you look at like, I don't know if you follow butcher box or whatever, like they, what they do is like have a rotating, like they'll do like free ground beef for oh, life. Ground beef for, uh, for life. Yeah. yeah. I actually or, have that. That's my, uh, I have that too, so, yeah. but they, they have like, they have bacon. I had like, they've done like free bacon for life or whatever. And it's like, they're just, that's like the box never gets discounted, right? They never, right. They never lower their prices. What they do is like, they have like additional inventory and they're based and they're essentially giving you, they are making you feel like you've just won something for free, even though most likely they're. Yeah. They bake that into the price for sure. Price, right? That is interesting. So, Cause it did feel like that too. I'm like, Oh wow. Ground beef for life. That's you're like, cool. I, would, I love ground beef. Like <laughs> put it in the box. But uh, yeah. And so it's like the more that you can do things like that, I think the the more people will also have like perceived, not even just perceived. It's, like, it's true. Like that you feel good. Like when you're, when you, when you feel like you want something or like got something for free. Right. I, I like it. So maybe not a discount, but something like value additive that produces urgency. Is there, uh, so we have five emails now. Welcome, Escalate, uh, Social Proof, AppSumo Case Study, Sneak Peek, um, Value Add into the course itself, and then the Value Add slash Urgency Play. Is there something after that? It seems like if they don't go with that, then it's like probably not interested. Maybe like one last final reminder or something like that. What, what, what's what's kind of next? I mean, yeah, I think you could also then just go into if they're not interested in the course, that doesn't necessarily mean they're not going to be interested in the consulting. Right. So I think mm-hmm. like I would, I would do maybe one of your like stronger sales pitches for actually working with us with like working with you. Um, yeah. I mean, and also by the way, just like the, a note about lead nurturing is like, once they become a customer, like you don't, you don't have to keep doing these things. Like at that point, no, we would set an exclusionary list of like yeah. anybody who's currently a client, anybody who's currently a course customer, yes. we take them off of this list for sure. Yes, exactly. So like the conversion and then, and then you can also, what you could do is let's say they don't engage, like let's say they started engaging in the beginning and they kind of drop off. What you could then do is uh, create a time based uh, rule in HubSpot, right. And just be like, Hey, in 30 days, um, like hit them back with something a little bit more like another free value add thing. So, or, or that could be a good time to pitch them like some kind of a, um, a time scarcity thing for the course. So like mm-hmm. you could always revisit, just kind of change up your content. But I would say like the, the bigger indication is like, if someone is not responding or they're not engaging, like you just ease up, like don't, don't send them emails every single day or, or even close to that, like take the hint and then come back. Maybe that was just like a bad time for them. Okay, cool. So I added that in, I'm creating a list here. Like I said, so I've got number one, welcome email, yep. number two, escalate, number three, social proof. And let's say like they open one of those or like none of those, but they were, well, if they open none of those, that wouldn't be a good sign. Let's say they open one or two, uh, but maybe not the third, then maybe like we wait the 30 days, add yeah. another piece of, uh, social proof or value additive stuff, and then restart the campaign from that point once they're re-engaged. But other than that, we kind of just filter through, go straight down the list up to the point where it's like, all right, social proof, sneak peek, value add slash urgency. And then I'll just call it Hail Mary. You know, it's just like, all right, here's the last try. And then if they don't sign up, then they're just on the email list and whatever. That's cool. One thing I would say that is a great Hail Mary is a quiz. So like people Mm. at their core are just want to learn about themselves. Right. And so if you could come up with a quiz, like I, for example, got, got by Glossier, what kind of skin routine do you need <laughs> quiz? And then at the end of it, right. And they'll ask you questions or like, this is the kind of skin I have. This is what I'm interested in, whatever. And then they'll be like, they'll make recommendations based on what you're saying you want. So what you could do is also like have different varying stages and, or, and like the answer to the quiz it could be, hey, you need to learn a little bit more before you can work with us. Like, they're not said like that, but more like, hey, you're a novice in this. Here's some free resources. Or, hey, look, you're a good fit for this course. And here you can learn about the course. And then there's a, or you could be like, you're ready to jump right in. Um, and one of the questions could be, you know, like, how much are you currently paying for content marketing? Or how much are you, you know, what budget do you have? And then that could also be a qualifier for you. Um, 
But the more that you can make it fun and like have people kind of learn about themselves and their own knowledge, you could even be like a knowledge based quiz where it's like, how proficient are you in content marketing? And then that way you're kind of like, you're just curious, but at the end of it, you can, um, you can make recommendations to kind of send them down different paths. But I think that if I was, if I, if somebody stopped engaging, the one thing that I would do is make it about them, like Mm -hmm. turn the focus back on them. Okay. I think we've covered the uh, core nurturing sequence to the sales pitch. I have another question that's somewhat related. Okay. Um, so on part one, we kind of left off and I was alluding to this, this email course that I had written up. So I basically took the first couple lessons from the, the full course and truncated them into like six or seven email course things where it, it takes a lot of the same text content less of the video strips out a lot of the examples and basically just gives you the core fundamentals to get you to the point where you can build a content roadmap report. So it's just like a no frills version. It's way smaller. Obviously, you know, we have 12 hours of content and the uh, 11 hours and 59 minutes of content in the course itself, right? The very specific number. Um, So it's not quite that, but I was going to offer it for free. It's just like a lead magnet and, uh, I don't know. So I have, I have two questions here. If I offer for free and I have six or seven emails that are like value additive and like they signed up for the email course, can I just launch into a sales pitch right after that? Assuming that they're, you know, already interested in the course itself since they signed up for an email course on the same topic. Or... Yeah, I would, I would make that, I would do this the same thing with the footer. Like I would just, um, keep the agency link there or keep the, keep the course link, like want more, okay. you know, like, um, and because just because someone signed up for like a free course doesn't mean that they're like necessarily interested in paying a thousand dollars for a course. That's you know? true. Well, let me, let me interrupt then and say, what if I, what if we pay, uh, charge for it? Like, it's still super valuable. Like what if we charge $49 or something like that for like the miniature version of the email course? Yeah. Well, why know. not? Um, why not just have a premium newsletter at that point? Um, Cause a premium newsletter really means that we have to, spend a lot of time and energy like updating it like it's probably going to be daily if not or weekly if not daily i don't know a premium newsletter is like a new business like that's that's a whole new business model yeah but this is like what you're paying i don't know i this is a product it's an info product in the same way that the course is it's yeah. already created and we would just set it up on an auto sequence and it gives yeah like you know a tenth of the value of the course it's not it's not as robust there's not quizzes there's not um you know video modules but like you know, if you really just want to like quickly learn how to create a, a content roadmap report, like we'll give the spreadsheets and stuff like that, where you can take the templates and plug and play. Um, I, I think it's probably worth some money, um, but also we're probably going to like get a higher overall ceiling, like a, a more, more like leads if we actually like make it free versus like kind of a paid thing. I don't know. This is like a random idea I, I came up with last time when we talked about like how the course is still pretty expensive as, as sort of a tripwire as sort of a, a first, you know, paid offer. Yeah. I think that the email course, like the, the, the goal of that, right. Like signing up for a free course, like one, I think, have you heard of, have you heard of email mastery? Do you know them? No. Um, they, so they have like a free email course that like teaches you email marketing in seven days. So like, it's like a, it's a, it's a week long course. And like every day they send you a new lesson. Right. And at the end of it, they upsell you to their consulting. Right. And mm-hmm. it like, it's a, it's kind of like, you know what you're getting when you're signing up for it. You're like, I'm learning and I'll learn the basics of email marketing in seven days. And then they still send you sporadic emails after that. Like the way that you guys would just like a newsletter, like a monthly newsletter. thing. Yeah. But I would say that like, it makes sense to be like, Hey, you've kind of learned the basics. Now take that knowledge and make it more like, you know, apply it, make it more advanced. Like let's work together or like here, you've gotten the free course. Now you can like, now here's what you would learn in the advanced course. Right. So like, and you could even do a recap on your last day and be like, all right. So like this week we learned like X, Y, and Z, like now let's talk about turning that into profit or whatever. And then you have a, a more streamlined pitch for your actual course. And then you can send a couple follow-up emails on that. Right. Where like, just different highlighted um, benefits of the course, people taking the course. I wouldn't put that all in one email. I would break that up. But like you could see based on how somebody engaged with the free six emails that you have, let's say they like, if they stopped opening, like you can say has, has opened an email in the last, uh, you know, 10 days. If they've opened any of those emails, that's when you can start pitching them the 
the uh, paid course. Okay. I love that. I'm definitely going to try that one out. I'll, I'll look at that as an experiment. Whereas the other one's kind of a core part of, of what we're going to do. And we can like iterate on like the specific emails, but I'll look at this email uh, course as like a, an experiment to see if anybody signs up. And if they do sign up, how many click through, how many open. Um, and you know, if they go through it, like how many people actually sign up for the real course. So we'll, we'll just kind of test it out. I think. What's your, um, what's your site traffic like? Like how many people actually go to the Be Omniscient website? I have no idea. Uh, I don't think it's a ton right now, but we've just started investing in our own content marketing within the last like three to four to five months. Um, we, we did a little bit before, but we mainly repurpose content from like our own sites, our personal sites. So I would say it's pretty new for us. We're at a 36 domain rating. We're probably going to invest in some link building. It looks like we get uh, 500 visitors a week. Mm -hmm. So it's really low right now. Um, We probably have a couple hundred, you know, 500 people on the email list right now. But I'm, you know, we're putting the foundations in place. Like the point of all this is to basically plan for like when we do scale, because now we're going to be doing these monthly events with like different speakers, uh, which you should do one sometime. Actually, that'd be awesome. Um, (laughs) We're we're using that as a lead gen play. Uh, We're going to be obviously like doing more content and link building and to, to build up like an inbound flow um, and just generally experimenting with building up that email list. So right now we're pretty low. Yeah. I was just thinking like, um, you know, is there, let's see, because right now your like main CTA on Omniscient is the free strategy call. I'm just wondering like how many people would be interested in signing up for something more like passive, like a free email course, you know, like a free email marketing, um, rather content marketing, like course via email. So I think that could be an experimental way to try the like, or just, you know, having a pop-up that. Yeah. I was going to say like a pop-up maybe better or something less, uh, upfront. Cause I, I I don't want to, a lot of like course creators that are specifically course creators, like the Ramit Sadies and, uh, Brian Deans, mm-hmm. they don't even have like their pricing or the products on the website. I don't want to be like that because we want to sell up market. Like we don't want to sell just the courses. Like we really want the agency to be the main thing. So I, I don't want somebody to come to the website and like not be able to find a way to talk to us about the agency. You know what I mean? Yes. Because yeah. most people who are going to be like most of our traffic is direct. Most people are probably coming uh, because they got referred or because like they've seen us on Twitter, or, like whatever. They know like the founders and like they are probably looking at the agency. Um, so I, I'd be hesitant about like actually reducing that CTA or changing that on the, the homepage, but we could do a pop-up. We could also make it like the main CTA on every single blog post because people who are coming on blogs are like maybe coming from SEO. They're maybe coming from social. They're probably yeah. not as warmed up, but the homepage itself, like if they're coming there, it's a good chance that they are actually interested in the agency. Yeah. We, we wanted to say that way anyway. <laughs> yeah. I like that. Um, yeah, I mean I can show you a couple of examples, but I think I think that you should experiment with like different placement. I obviously like in within the blog post is one option for sure and then like exit intent too, like if someone gets onto your site and then like before they leave like a pop up that's just like, "Hey, we'll teach you, you know, content marketing in 7 days or whatever length of time you want to do." But I think that that is that could be a good introduction even before a strategy call because i wouldn't know necessarily like as a cold user like i don't know what i would talk to you guys about right like i'm like i want to grow my traffic but i don't know what my goals are i don't know what i want to it's it's like i think that you're putting a lot of onus on the potential customer by having them like opt into a call um versus potentially like letting them get to know you a little better and be like here's what i can expect yeah that's that's a good point so I'm going to optimize. I don't know if we've done this. I think we have scroll CTAs and that's about it. And then image CTAs at the bottom, which are so subtle that people never notice those. Um, I'm going to optimize the blog to basically be a little bit more aggressive on the pop-ups and stuff um, and try to convert some of that traffic, especially as we start to grow our traffic and not for the free strategy call. Like basically pitch the email list, pitch an ebook, pitch the course, like whatever. Um pitch something like a small value additive thing for people who are coming in just through the content and don't actually know that we're an agency yet. Yeah, totally. I think that's your best bet. I have a question just in general about like the concept of email marketing and like how much, like how, how worth it at a small stage it is to invest a bunch in uh, like email. Cause like 
I've thought about like you, you mentioned the premium newsletter and maybe we don't need to do a premium like paid thing, but there is this, like, it's very popular right now to like build a business around an email list. Um, AppSumo, you guys were pretty early on that trend, I would say. Yeah. Uh, the hustle is like another example. They obviously had a paid community and like a premium product, but, um, I, I feel like the hype with these things is, um, kind of over it's over generalized sometimes in the same way that content marketing is content marketing is one of those things that has been oversold in my opinion because not every business is actually going to benefit from it app sumo right. is hubspot is but like many industries just don't have the traffic they don't have the search volume like it's it's not going to work for them if they invest in it so my question is how worth it would it be for us to to attract people just for the email list, like basically people who want to get our emails for the sake of the emails. Like it's like email as a product almost. And yeah. then on the flip side, like what's the minimum viable email marketing for a business like us that, you know, we, we may not, maybe we will, maybe email is like the big channel for us, but like, does that question make sense at all? Like, yeah, I think the answer to that question is that in order for email to be, to work for you, you kind of have to become a content company right? Like you have to have content. Your emails are not going to be your main driver of revenue if all you're doing is pitching your agency, right? So it's kind of like you have to have another business on top of the agency of like, of creating content and lead nurturing and all that, which you're already doing, right? Like that's the course, right? And you have a course and you have your office hours and you're like, you're creating content. So like now it's kind of time to take that content and turn it in to like, turn that into a newsletter and what people are coming to you for is not necessarily working with you. It's learning from you, right? Like you're the same, the same reason that people um, will join HubSpot's newsletter for the content, right? Like they, they have good quality content and people don't even really realize what they do because they're here for the content. And so I think like, I think that that's kind of like the, the mindset shift is that, you're not just an agency that works with people. You're also a, like a thought leader and the way that people are going to, like the reason people are going to join your email list is because they want to learn from you. Yeah. It it actually seems like, as you're saying this, I'm thinking that email is probably the one channel that we're going to need to use if we want to grow that side of the business. Um, The agency, we can grow via sales, referrals, all kinds of different ways. Yeah, absolutely. But if we want to grow the course, like we kind of have to do email and do it well. Yes. And then like, I think, you know, a lot of time it's like the, the classic like course funnel is like, there's, you run Facebook ads, right. For like cold traffic and then to a webinar and the webinar collects your email. And then that's how you sell the course. But it's like, you need that. You definitely need the, like the piece where you're communicating with customers, like the, and email is like your most people's number one communication tool when actually speaking to prospective customers. Um, I would agree. I think for the agency side, you're, probably your best bet is referral, like direct referrals, right? Most people end up finding agencies through word of mouth, right? Like that's, I think there's so many agencies and it's, I wouldn't know from someone's email if I would want to spend, you know, thousands of dollars a month working with them. I think we may trickle some clients in, but it's not like something we can actively pursue via like that kind of content to email to course flow. It's like maybe one out of a hundred people that goes through that. They're like, oh, actually my business could really benefit from this. So I'm going to tell my boss that, hey, Omniscient does this. We should just contract these guys. They seem great. Yeah. But it's like, that shouldn't be the active goal there. So I'm almost looking at this from from a marketing standpoint and like the person who's looking at after like sales and marketing, I'm looking at these kind of separately, like the agency and the course and like the, the content funnel versus like the, the services funnel, right? Like they're, they're almost two separate sides of the business. I agree. That's- Obviously they relate, like they both kind of co- you coincide. Right. Yep. But um, yeah, it seems like looking at them separately is the way to go. A hundred percent. And you're already doing it right. Like, I think that's the important pit like piece is that you're already creating content. And so like, this is really more like of an engine of communicating directly with people, right? Like repurposing that content into communication. Yeah. I, I do think like it would be sick to build out like a, a not passive business, obviously, but like there, we have the services side and that's very successful, but it is a goal of mine to like build out kind of more education materials, more of the, yeah. the course products. I, I think doing that, it showed me how possible it is because it was like the start of the pandemic when we built that course. We're like, all right, we're, we're just sitting at home, you know, like yeah. we don't have any happy hours. Let's, let's just put this out there. Let's just get down and like see how hard it is to create a course. It's like if you had never written a book before. Like, I'm sure it's a really hard process, but after you write the first one, you're like, oh, okay, I can write a book. So now I'm thinking, all right, we can, we can do courses. 
mm-hmm. and we can sell them. So it is an aspiration of mine to build that into a bigger business than it is right now. Well, I mean, it scales way easier than your consulting does, right? Like there's no real limit to how many people can buy your course. Um, and like, there's, you know, a lot of like good courses will have a community component to it, which that is something that you would need to think about scaling, but like, that's, it's a much more scalable model. And I think that, um, like, that's also the benefit of an email list is that like, every time you release something new, you already have a list of people that you can, that you can blast. Right. So like anyone who purchases your course in AppSumo, for example, like you're going to get their email through teachable. And then like. Now, whenever you make a new course, you have customers that are already kind of like who know who you are and like you can you can upsell them directly as opposed to starting from scratch each time. I love it. Um, and you can help people with uh, their email marketing, I'm assuming. <laughs> sure can. Um, if you want to reach out to me, my email is uh, Ilona Bramava at gmail.com. Um, but yeah, I'm would love to, I'm happy to talk through anyone's email strategy too, if they have questions. Um, and we'll put that in the, the show notes, all your email yeah. and your contact info and stuff if you want, or maybe not your email. I don't know. Yeah. We should take that out. I honestly yeah. was like, my last name is really complicated. Again, off the record. This <laughs> the best thing ever, basically. So my, my name is Alona Abramova and, but I, when I made the email that was taken. So I was like, okay, my, my name ends in an A. My last name starts in an A. I'll just blend them. So it's alone. Ever, ever. But what happens is people think I just misspell my email all the time. And so they email Alona Abramova at gmail.com. And that girl fucking hates me. That girl sends me emails all the time being like, why would you make this? Your oh, email? I see what you did. Yeah. You, you combine the A as like an anchor to both sides. An anchor to both sides because there was just, there, it wasn't available. And she was like, so mad at me for doing this because she's like, I get all of your medical <laughs> information. I get like your email. She knows everything about me. She could steal my identity today if she wanted to. Wait, so we have to, can we keep this part? That's kind of interesting. I don't know. Sure. <laughs> um, that poor girl. I hope she doesn't listen to this because she is not a fan of mine. <laughs> nah, like 50 people listen to this. So we're good. <laughs> it would be really crazy if she was one of them though. That, that would be crazy. She's um, like following all, all the content that you put out just to kind of keep tabs on you. Yeah. She's building up. <laughs> she's one day going to kill me. Um, and this is just, yeah, part of the, part of the master plan, but, um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm actually thinking about doing, creating a course too. So this is a timely conversation. Um, I think a lot of, a lot of people have questions about people think that email marketing is just so like, I think elusive, right? Like people think that there's like this magic to it. And I think it's, it's probably similar to content marketing where there's like, there's kind of like heuristics and rules of thumb and like just, you know, simple rules of engagement. Um, and a lot of it is pretty, like not earth shattering. A lot of it's pretty basic stuff. It's just like, Hey, you know, you're talking to a person. How would you like to be spoken to? <laughs> what kind of things do you enjoy in your, in your com- like communications? And so, um, yeah, thinking about doing something like that. So I will, I'll keep you posted on that. You should, and you should write blog posts about this stuff too. This is going to be a semi rant, but it's like pe- people who do what I do have really fucked up like information in, in most marketing and sales spheres. Because like, if you're really good at SEO, you don't actually have to have like the, the expert knowledge. Right. So I'm, th- this is really true in content and SEO. It's really true in CRO, not as much anymore, because I think CXL is like the shining example of a company that really like put integrity first when they were writing content. Like I know that when I worked there, like it was like, if I cited a bullshit study, like I would get yelled at, you know, like it wasn't like, oh, it works. Like, fuck it, just ship it. It was mm-hmm. like, we actually wanted to produce true stuff. But uh, with email, this reminded me because I was looking up how to write like welcome emails. I, I'm not good at that stuff. <laughs> and every article was horrible. Like it was like, yeah. it spent a thousand words being like, here's why email marketing is important. Did you know that for every dollar spent, $90 ROI, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I'm like, no, 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 no. Show me how to write a welcome email from somebody who's done it. That's all I want. That's, yeah. There's no good information. And that's why people are so confused by content marketing. That's why they're so confused by email marketing and all this stuff. It's pretty simple. Like if, for people that actually do it and the experts, if they yeah. just wrote what they do, nobody would be confused by it. But it's just like uh, all this obfuscation from freelance writers who've never done the thing. I couldn't agree more. And that's honestly why I've been, I was like pretty anti SEO for a long time. Like I didn't want to, I mean, it's been a godsend for us and like, I obviously I'm converted, but it's like for a long time, I just didn't want to have articles 
that said nothing. Like I, I've been on so many email lists. Um, like I used to love this one email list called well and good, which is like a wellness email list. Right. And, uh, sometimes they'll be like, you know, the surprising ingredient and in deodorant that whatever. And it's just like, you click on that article and then they don't really even tell you like at the end of it, they're just, they're just like, yeah, doctors still aren't sure. Anyway, like, it just feels like, well, why am I here? You know, I want to, it's like, eventually people catch on and they're like, well, yeah. I don't want to just get and got all the time. I actually want to learn things. And, um, and you I think don't build, you don't build a brand that way. You can't, you can't like build a sustainable following that way. You're going to get a lot of first time beginner readers who are like, yeah. Oh, I'm interested in learning about email. So like, I might as well sign up for this pop-up where I can learn about email. And then you learn enough. And eventually you're like, all right, this is clearly not legit advice. Like this is just a, fl- a bunch of fluffy content. Yeah. And then you bounce. Whereas I think I've seen this with CXL, like people would read every article that we wrote and they would like call us out if we had an inaccurate information. Like they were that in tune with like the articles we were producing and for the content yeah. itself. And it's like, that's a brand, that's a community, that's a following. Absolutely. And, that's the same thing. They hold you really yeah. accountable. Like the, yeah, we wrote that article about, um, it was like Squarespace versus WordPress, right? It was like a showdown. And I mean, it's no surprise that the AppSumo audience are WordPress people, like Clearly, you know, it's a lot more like technically savvy people who are willing to like put in the work to like make a WordPress website work. But we at the end of the article were like, yeah, we're probably partial to WordPress, but they felt like the article was like too nice about Squarespace. And the amount of like the amount of vitriol was just like, this is a, this is like a puff piece. Like this is, you know, you're just trying to rank for this. Like they they can see, they can like smell the keywords on the page and they like, but, and I like that though, it keeps you accountable, keeps you honest. Like it, it makes sure that the the content you're putting out is actually thought provoking and like valuable to your audience, as opposed to just like here for first timers who happen to find you via Google. Um, oh man, I want to tell you, yes. Okay. I would just, the last thing I want to end on this note is that there are so many good resources for email that I think you should absolutely take a look at. Um, really good emails is one of them. That is, um, that's mostly for e-commerce though just as a caveat, you can still learn some things from that one, but they don't, they don't break down why the email itself is good. Email mastery does like what they'll do. I can actually show you what they do is they take, um, they take an email and they'll hold on. Let me show you. That's the one with the course you're talking about, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. So here's a perfect example. Oh, you've disabled screen share. And can you let me show my screen? Yeah. Let me see. Um, I wish this was just default. There we go. Should be good now. Okay, cool. So here's, so this is like Peloton's 30 day trial email, right? Mm-hmm. So they tell you at the top, this is selling the free trial, not the bike. And then they'll tell you, this is why this works right? Let's you visualize the offer from the subject line, which is take home, bring home the bike. Then it's like clear value proposition in eight words. So you could see like, Hey, they have like the breakdown of the, they have the email itself yeah. and they have little, like a, like bullet point kind of call out things with notes on what the specific thing it is. And, and kind of like qualitative information, like well positioned CTA. Yes, um, exactly. Here's benefits, all that stuff. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, it's like it, a, like a teardown of sorts. Yes, exactly. And they do teardowns too, but, um, and then, but they actually show you, this is like, yeah, the Yeti email marketing teardown. And so they'll, they'll go from like, from lead generation through to the, like the welcome email. Oh, um, I want to start doing this kind of content with, uh, I with, love with our, like our agency. I, we, this has been on our backlog for so long. It's, it's so time consuming to do stuff like this. To do teardowns. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it is. And like, you have to you have to be kind of like very aware of what you're doing, right? Like you have to like sign up for the email and then like make sure that you're clocking kind of the entire communication funnel that you're getting. For example, yeah, it's like a, like a live live streaming of content of sorts. Like you, you, you have to like, yeah. cal- you have to log what you think in each given moment and how you feel. It's, it's very strange. It's like, yeah, yeah like a travel log so like, or something. Let's take this Yeti one for an example, right? So they, they're talking about how, hey, like this, the reason that the welcome email for Yeti is good is because it makes the subscriber feel like they've joined something cool. Right. Which is like, that's what I was telling you. I think when we spoke last time, which is like, you want people to feel like, Oh yeah, I found like my home in this community. Right. Or like at the very least, like I'm here and I'm going to enjoy what I'm going to get in my inbox. Like I'm going to look forward to these emails as opposed to just like another thing I have to like archive as it comes in. Um, And then the second thing that they do 
is invite you to listen to their podcast, which is kind of what we were talking about with like giving them value, right? Like providing content and giving someone like a, like something that makes them feel like they've just gotten something for free that they would have otherwise had to pay for. Like it, it gives you like a feeling of being like an insider, um, and feel like you have a value add. And then, um, hold on, let's see. We don't have to include this, but I'm just going to show you. Then their, um, then their newsletter is like what your campaigns would be like. Right. But this is like when new with new products, but this is similar in the sense that like every time you guys have something new, like a new article, that's like the opportunity. That's not part of your lead nurturing, but that's like an opportunity to be like, you know, mass slash or whole list of like, this is kind of like the campaign we want to send. And this is like the, um, the information we want you to get this month. And you guys are already doing that, right? Um, yeah, for sure. And like, how is that? Um, how has that been working? Like your, your monthly or weekly campaign? <laughs> we do a monthly one. I, I don't know. We've only been doing it for a couple months, so I don't know any stats right now. It, it's okay. really small numbers. So, it's, you know, we get some signups to our webinars. I know that. Yeah. I think like e-commerce is a little different than, than service admittedly, right. Especially with like a physical product like this. Um, but the, the kind of like principles are the same where it's, they're still doing like lead nurturing by like first welcoming you to their community, then giving you something free, then kind of like, like getting you excited about every time they have something new coming out. So, and then like the social proof, right. Like follow us or like, you know, a, a review, they'll post a review, like a five-star review. Um, that's all the same thing as like your case study and your like, you know, content delivery. It's kind of like they're the, the functions of the thing are the same, just the way that they look kind of present differently. Sick. Yeah. I'm definitely going to sign up for email mastery. Um, all right, cool. Well, cool. that, that seems like a, enough email marketing for today. Thank you. Alana. Right. Of course. 